Bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this class. Welcome to Brazil. My name is Fabio Stiebel. I'm the executive director of ITS Rio, and I'm here with Selena. Selena, want to say hi? Hi, I'm Selena. Nice to be here with you. I would love to say that we are remote, virtual, hybrid because this is COVID. But because we are a global network, this is how we do anyway. So here at the main screens in the first slide, what you see is an event we host in Rio de Janeiro around three years ago uh, before COVID stage. We got together 400 people for 40 countries um, with the network of centers to think about an AI research agenda. Mood stakeholder, different perspectives, and we learned so much. So in this class, we kind of share some of the findings we had and some of the findings about Brazil that uh, support this knowledge. Um, so we are ITS Real Institute for Technology uh, and Society. We are based in Brazil, but we have a global uh, reach. Uh, this was a previous view from the office in Rio de Janeiro. If you come, please take a look at our office uh, windows. It's even more beauty now in the new uh, office headquarters. Um, and uh, we hope that after COVID, uh, we can be together physically and share more of what we are doing. Um, I have a PhD at Leeds University in Political Science, a uh, postdoc at the University in Electronic Government, and I, as Selena, I am affiliated to the Blackburn Klein Center at the University of Harvard. And very quickly, I'm Selena, Project Director at ITS. I also hold an LLM from Harvard Law School focusing on human rights and technology and also an affiliated to the Bergman Klein Center back at Harvard. I think we are weirdos. I think uh, uh, we say our statement of what we study and so on, but at ITS, we do many things. Sometimes we apply um, technology, so we have to create it. Um, we have the bot catcher, for example, an algorithm that identify bots. Sometimes there's a policy role we play. So the national AI policy, we have been participated in that, internet regulation, and capacity building, we have been done lots on trying to capacitate other stakeholders on understanding AI. And there is, in the media, also we have a strong presence trying to uh, understand and illustrate the effects that AI can have in Brazil. I'll, we start the chat with you. Uh, in the middle, I want to swap places with Selena and then she closes. So you stay with us. Uh, this is kind of the program of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to compare here global and global com global perspectives. So we have the global north, we have the global south, and we're going to put them kind of like a really sharp differences so we can understand uh, and illustrate how challenging it is to think AI nowadays. We start with connectivity uh, and infrastructure. There you're going to see the difference of um, how countries can be really different in some of the needs for AI and, and, and what society has of challenges. We move them to policy strategies and research. Uh, then we're going to see how AI is being regulated. And then we're going to see the role of universities at play. Uh, we illustrate briefly about data ecosystems in the health sectors. And then we end with knowledge of what the universities of what academics could be doing. And then um, uh, the sharp difference between global north and global south. This is a, a 40 minutes class. So we're not going to go in full details, but we hope that we leave uh, you leave this session with a memory and illustration, like an image to show how sharp differences exist from one place to another. So let's start with connectivity. Um, connectivity started worldwide uh, uh, almost around the same time. So around the 90s, 95, 97, 98, uh, lots of countries start to receive connectivity. Uh, right now, what we have is a world that is connected. But when I say world, there are some sharp differences and you should be aware of that. Uh, so if you look at Africa, for example, you see the animation of IP addresses usage in 2013. What you see is that uh, we don't have too much connectivity there. This connectivity translates to data. We have a lot of, uh, of data, like uh, identity data that is missing uh, or organized data for help that is just non-existent. If you look at Brazil and, and Latin America, you see more or less uh, coherent narratives where we have around 70% of the population that is connected. This is the record for Brazil. Uh, and then one third that is disconnected. And when you look at the quality of this internet, it's 
changed a lot. So if you think about the use of AI and you think about the relationship between connectivity and the internet, we must consider that you won't have internet all the time. You won't have internet for all. You won't have internet sufficient for all you need. So it's a very, an ecosystem. If you look at the West of Europe, you see a completely different um, spectrums in, in China as well. So uh, this is percentage of individuals using the internet in each country. And then you can see a clear uh, global north, almost uh, dark colors, and then global south, light colors, uh, where you see the lack of internet connectivity for the population. Brazil is not bad. Um, and uh, Latin America is not uh, sharply bad. If we consider the year we are and where we should be, we are really bad because having one third of the population is just not acceptable. But it's not a place of without internet, it's a place with internet. And if you look at the cities, if you look at how it plays along, you see that we have lots of sectors of the society that are way more uh, global north related than the global south. So Brazil, for example, can be a mix of both. Uh, you have people who are using 5G uh, and then industries that are fully connected and the use of IoT and others who doesn't have uh, internet connections or if you have a connection, you have a zero rating plan or companies that are just disconnected or cities that are disconnected. Uh, if, you move, if you move away from connectivity to internet speeds, you see the problem has even more severe consequences where some countries kind of have lots of internet that you need to circulate data and others don't. And then Latin America in this sense, in this manner, uh, kind of relates to Africa in general, uh, as you can see. So uh, we might have internet, but the problem of good quality of internet or what you can do, uh, the, the, the meaningful connectivity there, it, it might be uh, a little stiff. Let's move to infrastructure. And then we're gonna put here two topics, just to make how sharp differences these are. And these are very common to us. So uh, California, for example, you have self-driving cars. You have legislation for that. Uh, you have companies that are working that. You have crossing uh, with sectors of transportation, kind of uh, electric cars, or we're gonna have like B2B. Uh, if you look at China, you're gonna have like a full fleet of taxis and buses that becomes electrics, and some of them are becoming self-driving cars. Uh, it's quite different from the context we have here. So this is kind of like a, a picture that you should know from you have seen before. What you're not seeing is how hard it is to put a self-driving car within uh, these roads. So you see a very sharp uh, differences of, um, of income. And some of them, they'll have like roads that are similar to California, like the ones in the front, but others, they might not have roads uh, uh, mentioned in the maps. As you can see in the right, uh, you see that the roads that are there, if you walk around, are not reported in Google Maps accordingly. And then um, the kind of obstacles, the kind of, um, of uh, challenges that are for self-driving cars are sharply different. So when you look at the Global South, you're talking about self-driving cars, not coming um, um, soon. Maybe inside of uh, farms, maybe inside of industries, maybe in silent systems, but in cities, even if you have this technology that works, you're not seeing it happening here. The same about um, home, home robots, right? Uh, well, during the COVID phase, COVID, COVID times, the, the robot vacuum cleaner, just the sales is spiked up. So lots of people buying it. And this sells a picture that homes are connected. The same for Siri, Alexa, and all the others. Uh, sales for that have spiked up. But this is not the average Brazilian household. Uh, the average Brazilian household, 60% uh, of the population earn up to around $250 a month per family. So you certainly won't have money to buy this, um, to buy a robot, for example, for, for vacuuming your house. But even if you did, uh, lots of housings are below the standards for the use of these equipment. It's just uh, for the size, for the occupation, for the kind of floor, for the kind of connectivity. It's just really bad. And we do have a quite significant amount of houses without electricity. So I'm not even saying that you could use a robot. It's just that you cannot use electricity at all. Um, I move now to, to Selina. Thank you, Fabro. So following up on what Fabra was explaining, because uh, when we talked about when you talk about AI, 
we normally take for granted that the infrastructure is there in place for it to be used. It's just a matter to, uh, of actually getting in, uh, connecting with, with the devices. But as we, we saw, there are so many like uh, really under uh, beneath, uh, infrastructure that is really essential that in, we don't think that sometimes lots of countries are still not ready for that. And uh, regarding policy strategies, it's important also to note the difference of how uh, global North countries and global South countries are positioning themselves to try and think about uh, AI policy strategies. So um, ITS, uh, if Fabio, next slide. Uh, All right, I have that. <laughs> we did a, a, a mapping of uh, the worldwide national uh, AI strategies. We developed this in, uh, we published this in, in, in Portuguese. So for those who are Portuguese speaking could uh, have a look on, on our webpage. But anyway, uh, we mapped these strategies using the resources from the Future of Life um, website. And here we can see uh, the green ones are the countries where they have uh, developed an AI strategy plan. Uh, and the yellow ones are, those that are still developing. So for example, Brazil is in the yellow because it's developed, uh, they put it for public consultation, it's AI national strategy. Uh, ITS contributed to this, uh, to this uh, public consultation, but it's still uh, due to COVID and all, it's still on hold. So we don't know how it will, um, with the pace that it will move forward. But anyway, you can again see the different uh, kind of color coding and to show that from around 35 uh, AI policy strategies that there are in being developing or that are developed or being developing in the world, uh, one third of them, only one third of them are related to uh, global South countries. Um, and if you see here, it's, uh, no, I can go continue. Uh, here, it's an, just a quick anecdote from uh, Brazil. This uh, Aldo Rebelo was a, our former science uh, and technology minister. So here you could see when we start talk about policy, uh, he just, he, uh, a long time, uh, some time ago, he presented this bill that was actually prohibiting automation in the public sector. So you can see how these uh, policy initiatives can be uh, pointing in different directions. This was before the um, Brazil launched this public consultation. But anyway, he was a, a someone with this for, an important, uh, uh, important figure that could be leading to one direction regarding uh, regulating AI and technology in a way that would curb its development and uh, would prevent people here from having the benefits that we know that AI applications uh, may have. <clears throat> so here is uh, just a snapshot of all these AI national strategies that I mentioned in this Future of Life website. You can guys very easily uh, find them. They <clears throat> Sorry. It's, some are just like some uh, proper uh, national strategies. Others are just some uh, initiatives, uh, not just robust, <clears throat> robust, but anyway, it's something uh, as, a, as a nice resource to, to look into. It can carry on. So uh, <clears throat> here it's important because research is one of the, the main pillars of these national strategies. So if we see again on this uh, aspect, a really, uh, Precise, uh, really harsh difference between Global North and Global South. Again, showing how Global North countries are still <clears throat> very strong producers and Global South consumers. So just to illustrate, among the 2000 main companies on research and development, 93% of them, of the AI patents are from companies located just in seven countries. So Japan with 33%, South Korea, 20%, USA, 18 Taiwan, China, 9 Germany, 3 and France, 2%. So you see still uh, 
even between these uh, global north countries are still really concentrated and no sign and very bad, like no close sign of any global south country in among this list. And, <clears throat> and when we go, uh, not just you see on the high level of, of research, when we go to um, like education <clears throat> in schools, for example, you see what the United States has been doing since the 90s, right? With uh, the MIT <clears throat> Mindstorm Lego kit introduced in schools. Now we have such a lot of ed techs and AI applications being used also uh, in, in, in schools for teenagers. And where we, we go to Brazil, again, the reality of most of our schools is, uh, Pablo? Uh, is the lack of, uh, of connectivity again. So uh, also ITS participated in some efforts to try and connect public schools because there were a lot of initiatives to try and bring uh, technology to help public education. But the, the main obstacle was, okay, we just don't, it's not possible because there is no internet, for example. So, uh, Again, this is another difference of how this and how important is the infrastructure to be in place so you can think about applying all these other, uh, all of the benefits that AI potentially may have in different areas. Um, uh, I move now to data ecosystems and we don't have strong research on this in Brazil and other countries to show. We do have some indexes but I think examples show better. So let's think about health. Health is an area where data and AI uh, have a very um, interesting path. Um, health is really deficitary uh, along the countries and the use of AI can help health to be less deficitary and increase uh, the public benefits for society uh, with treatment and so on. That said, uh, we can see clear, uh, we have identified in the AI debate clear benefits of that. You have uh, how to aid human decisions. So doctors can be aided, you don't have to replace them. Uh, you can help them to identify results, to identify labs, to identify uh, priorities and so on. Um, there are more precise analytics for pathology images. Uh, X-ray, for example, is something that AI is increasingly doing well for in, in, in some areas and that can uh, save the resource of human resources or doctors, nurses and other specialists to analyze that. Um, electronic health records, it's a mess because it's a very complex ecosystems and then AI can help to um, streamline and to make connections between that we understand the data. Now the COVID crisis is clear uh, the gap uh, around that because sometimes who takes a test, is not, you don't know it's the same patient who joins the, the, enters the hospital and who dies or not. It's very hard to cross this kind of data. Uh, with AI, it might be easier. They have good uh, promising results on that. And managing hospital capacity, uh, cap cap capacities and patient services. I think there is a um, clear industry-driven um, search for solutions here. But data is at the core. So when you look at the challenges, uh, lack of usable data is clear. Uh, I remember uh, listening from one of the main uh, health industries uh, providers uh, here that they don't know within their hospital which uh, intensive healthcare is the most um, efficient. So they have the data, they have infrastructure, they have everything. And even so, they could not make usable data from that. There's a mismatch of data formats. It's a place with very few standards and there is lots of uh, different challenges for uh, basic open data or even interoperability of data. There's unstructured inputs, incomplete records. Well, uh, health is a place where we can see lots of potential, but at the same time, the organization of data, the structure of this data is a clear challenge. So here is an example from the US. This is a very good agenda topic for AI and health in the US. So medical error is the third leading causes of death in the US. So why not use AI to aid doctors uh, to reduce medical error? Um, it's an interesting path. So let's look at Brazil. So 39% of health institutions record data in Brazil are written, manuscript format. Even if you want to digitalize, even if you want to try to use AI, you first have to make the government to be electronic. 
the sector to be electronic. And then uh, you can start thinking about use of data. And even if you look at the other spectrums, only 21% of institutions with access to internet keep health data in digital format uh, and organize it and so on. So it's a very, very, very corrupt um, structure uh, for AI to develop. So what you see in the agenda of AI in Brazil are some case studies. So for these disease, for this hospital, for this kind of treatments, then you see some promising. For these services, this array analysis, for this company, you see something. But AI debate here in health because of data cannot be generalized just because the data is too badly structured. And then lastly, we have the idea of knowledges. Uh, Selena? Yes. So uh, this is a very important point because there is two aspects, right? There is the lack of knowledge of people, as we mentioned, our also some uh, prominent uh, policy makers were sometimes maybe uh, may lack the knowledge of how AI systems work, of how potentially uh, beneficial it may be, uh, and <clears throat> how uh, and how it will uh, people will understand what is going on, right? Because uh, all these AI applications, be, for it to be like used, people first need to trust, and you can only trust something that you know. So there is a, and AI is something very complex. So there is a lot of, uh, of how to say, uh, homework to be done before uh, it's, instead, uh, in addition to all the infrastructure that has been put in place, uh, we could say that knowledge is also kind of an infrastructure necessary for the advancement of AI, especially here in the global south. So, um, here it's important to, uh, add, to enhance here universities' role in this sense. So, it's interesting because let's uh, thinking about the development of AI. Actually, it started all in uh, university, right? In Dartmouth College in summer of 1956. Uh, when some colleagues just proposed these a uh, 10 men study doing the summer of 96 to find out how uh, to make a machine use language form and abstraction and concepts and solve kind of problems now reserved to humans and improve themselves so it will <clears throat> that was the birth of ai as we know today uh, and although it started in the university it was actually much more developed using by the private sector like right with uh, research and development and using it uh, for uh, specific applications but i think now uh, it's important to move back a bit and rethink of how universities may have a role uh, to play on this discussion especially when we're talking about ai in the global south and AI inclusion, as was the topic of this event that we organized, as Fabio mentioned in the beginning. So uh, we have to think about of as a universities may be a place to foster all this debate, as it can have this open resource of of AI research uh, that can be used for like AI applications. Uh, university can also develop systems to uh, measure. This and assess the fairness and accuracy of AI systems. As we know, it's still a lot of debate regarding responsibility and liability for uh, mistakes happen uh, as a result of AI applications, how it will be um, governed, what it will be, the kinds of uh, liabilities that will be put in place, and will it be specific to one country and the other? What about self driving cars that may? move from one, uh, one country to the other. So <clears throat> there are many things that still needs to be discussed and, and thought about. So here is also another area where uh, AI, uh, universities may help to develop these systems that can um, try and measure this kind of uh, the aspect of fairness and accuracy. Also, uh, it may help develop AI impact analysis mecha mechanisms too. So you can see regarding like the social and economic impact of AI. So that's something that it's also important to be uh, taken into consideration when sometimes not always the private sector is that uh, oriented to analyze the, like the good effects uh, in the social realm that AI may have. Uh, then it can also convene meetings uh, with and bring together various stakeholders and try to close, close this gap 
among the participation of researchers, especially uh, promoting like the silo bursting on AI research. So uh, universities from around the world may get together with researchers to try and uh, foster this interchange of ideas. Uh, again, one something that happens, uh, we heard a lot with uh, AI researchers in Brazil, it's that it's there's happening this, um, how to say, uh, they are try they're getting all our the big the good brains they are moving away because they lack infrastructure also to work here uh and data is one of the uh, one of the problems that they don't have access to so if there is more infrastructure for them to be able to stay on their home countries but at the same time engage in conversation and uh, interchange with universities from the global north would be a, a nice a nice way to go. And lastly, uh, it can translate AI mechanism and describe its applications, opportunities, and risk. As I mentioned, it was it is a very complex uh, topic. Involves uh, people from uh, scientists, uh, engineering engineers, uh, developers, and also. Uh, lawyers, philosophers to try and think about all the ethical applications. So it's a really uh, topic that should be even more uh, multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary. So again, and university is ha has for per se all these uh, abilities at the same place, and they should only just try and 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 talk and conversate, uh, have a conversation and talk about it, and help translate for the general public all of the possible application and what are planning to do and the possible impacts and what kind of like responsibilities would be so people can have or can be more uh, at ease with all uh, these developments and <clears throat> again if we uh, continue here uh, and I <clears throat> regarding the advances in AI education, again, we could see a big difference of what countries are doing in this, as in this uh, topic. For example, uh, Canada wants to be the leader in AI training. It's investing 125 million uh, to create research centers. They want also uh, to for, uh, give opportunities and to attract all the bright minds of AI to, to be there. So they're thinking about all this ecosystem that involves and attract uh, the good researchers and, and, want, and make people want to go there to be trained in AI. South Korea has also uh, a plan to develop six new AI schools up to uh, 2022, next year, uh, and have the <clears throat> goal of training 5,000 specialists on AI. China, I think, is uh, from all these research, all the national uh, AI strategies, is the one that shows more. Uh, like uh, the the numbers, of course, is are the bigger ones. They want to create 50 universities, institutes, and centers only focused on AI. They're doing this five-year program to uh, have more than 500 professors and 500 students being formed every time with in AI. So we can see how they're investing in uh, forming the people that can develop, apply, and use AI uh, as, a, as a whole. So you can see how uh, important this topic is for, for China, for example. Uh, another example would be Mexico and Germany. They want to include AI in school curriculum. So you can see how this topic is really being treated and uh, dealt with in this uh, with the, in the, these different countries. And Brazil is still planning to create these AI centers, but it's still really uh, lagging behind. As we mentioned, the, our national policy, uh, a national strategy on AI is still on hold. So we don't know how, when this will be taken off the paper and put it in place, but still it's, it's a plan. At least it, it now it's something that people talk a bit about it, but even though it's a bit uh, still lagging behind. <clears throat> um, and just like to, uh, before like ending this discussion, uh, we think that 
AI debate needs, again, uh, imagination. So AI is something that involves imagination, creativity to solve complex problems. And you have to experiment, right? You have to test different deployments and, and governance of and governance systems to think about the best way to, to navigate all these uh, different appliances. And again, multi-stakeholder is, is a very important aspect and universities is also very well positioned to try and be the leader of these of this movement because as we know, for example, from internet governance, uh, uh, we how important it is to have a multi-stakeholder governance in place so different people with different areas of expertise can come together and try and develop a plan that will make sense for for that uh, for that specific situation and this inclusive perspective coming from the global north and global south is really important so as we are on these policy debates all going on it's important that all the, the forums that may foster this discussion and where governance is being discussed should always include people from uh, and countries from the global south global south again will be very much impacted by all the ai appliances and applications for example latin america uh, suffered a lot with the change on like for example textile industries when they moved in the 90s from Brazil, uh, from Latin America to Southeast Asia countries. Uh, there is also, again, a fear that something similar may happen with, uh, with AI uh, being automated and different uh, systems being used and will can, that could eventually affect uh, jobs here in, in, this, in this area. So again, we try, uh, to try and uh, bridge this gap of consumer and producers uh, there should be a like they should convene in different in, in one in one forum to discuss all these problems involving uh, AI and we don't as Faber mentioned there's still a big divide right so and whereas it's possible to try and bridge this gap even in though in the policy area this should be uh, fostered and again, getting back here to how universities can be one of the leaders to make this, uh, to, to make this way uh, forward. And I think we're going to the end of this conversation. And maybe it's important to say that this is in the references of uh, that we do. This is uh, some of the concepts that uh, have been discussed since in the Buckley centers and it's kind of a byproduct of the event that we did and the discussions that are going there so maybe this is how we, we kind of end um i think there is a it's really important to illustrate how uh differences between global north and global south impact the ai agenda so discussing self-driving cars or uh how health uh, ai and health can aid doctors it's a good topic but we do have others if you invert the agenda. So I'll, I'll close sharing one of the findings from this event. So we, we sent a survey around and then we have respondents from the Global South and Global North, they will self-declare themselves. And then we ask it, in your opinion, what's most important on the, um, on the um, debate of AI? Uh, Global North respondents said ethics, AI and ethics and principles. Uh, global global south respondent said access and capacity building so you can see how the agendas can be sharp difference i'm not saying that ethics is not important that's not on the top of the agenda i'm not saying that x is not important but it's not the top of the agenda it depends on who you ask um, these questions uh to so this is it uh selena do you want to want to add something else no, it was nice for you to remember bringing this up because I think that it, that it, that's how a nice way to illustrate because we are very from different starting points, right? So uh, that should be taken into consideration, and uh, global North countries should be more uh, open to try and be um, considerate of these situations that global South countries still need to to move a bit forward before 
get into really deep dive discussion regarding ethics, for example, even though it's super important. So I think these conversations has to have to happen more or less at the same time. Well, this is it. Any questions, write to us, visit us, come to the office um, when COVID is done. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.